Hello and welcome to our webinar from learning to read to <laughs> from learning to read to learning to learn building literacy in your emergent readers. I'm Heather Booth, audio editor at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. A link to today's slide presentation was included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download it, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download the slides by copying the URL on this screen into your web browser. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or if you need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions and we'll pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Last but not least, Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. We have a wonderful program for you today, so let's begin by meeting today's presenters. Beth Saxton occasionally reads books for grown-ups. She received an MLIS from the University of Western Ontario a bachelor's in psychology from Bowling Green State University and worked for Cleveland Public Library before coming to Overdrive. She loves books for kids of all ages, but especially YA, having served on the Prince, Edwards, and Morris Award committees. Jody Solomon grew up helping her school libraries from first grade. She also cataloged and put pockets and checkout cards into the books in her home collection as a child, which is something I also did. Fast forward a few years and Jody got an MLIS and SLMS from Kent State University and was a school librarian for about 17 years before coming to Overdrive. As the content specialist in the central region, she loves enlightening the students' worlds with books. Sheila Henline has been with Overdrive for over five years. Equipped with an MLIS and SLMS, she is currently serving schools in New York in building and maintaining their digital library collections. And Nikki Hieronis is an account manager at Overdrive, helping schools in the Pacific Northwest, Montana, Wyoming, and Alaska create reading happiness for students both in and out of the classroom. As a lifelong lover of literature and language and alliteration, she spent the last five years using this passion to help educators cultivate a space where reading is easy, accessible, and fun for all. Outside of the office, you'll find Nikki adventuring with her dogs and husband, riding horses into the sunset, and cheering, weeping for Cleveland sports teams. Thank you so much for joining us, Beth, Jody, Sheila, and Nikki. The floor is yours. Thank you. May I have the next slide, please? We are going to discuss together read along picture books, graphic novels for emergent readers and nonfiction and languages other than English titles. Next slide, please. Read along picture books provide multiple options for reading. Children can read on their own, along with the professional narrator and highlighted text, or they can listen to the book like an audiobook, but with pictures to help with comprehension. They can also speed up and slow down the playback, playback like an audiobook, which is good for struggling readers and those whose heritage language is other than that of the text. Next slide, please. Hearing the words while watching them promotes vocabulary acquisition, grammar, sentence structure, comprehension skills, and reinforces decoding. It also improves facility with cadence, pronunciation, and reading fluency. And as with any fiction, this format enhances problem solving, empathy, and critical and creative thinking without the burden of decoding static text alone. It has all the same elements as any other reading experience, such as character development, setting, plot, and more. 
Next slide, please. Here are some of my favorite newer titles. Change Sings, a Children's Anthem by Presidential Inaugural Poet Amanda Gorman, illustrated by Lauren Long, published by the Viking Books for Young Readers. It's a beautiful representation of being the change you wish to see in the world. Strong poetry and gorgeous images trace the path of a young Black girl with a large guitar through building inclusion, literally, and helping a diverse group of children come together to be that change. Shows hope for the future. The Very Quiet Cricket by Eric Carle, published by Penguin Group's World of Eric Carle, is a beloved story first published in 1990. The new read-along version has great sound, including insect voices. And of course, the text is highlighted as it is professionally narrated. I've included it here to share that digitization of older titles can really enhance the old favorites and make them more accessible. My City Speaks by Darren LaBeouf and Ashley Barron, published by Kids Can Press, is a journey with a blind child through the city. With her white cane, she experiences all the sounds, smells, and happenings all over the city. After, city, after hearing her city speak to her all day, in the end, the city listens to her. The Cot in the Living Room is by Hilda Eunice Borges, illustrated by Gabby D'Alessandro and published by Coquila. The quote on the back cover says, sometimes the best way to be a better neighbor is by imagining what it feels like to sleep on the pillow next door. A small Hispanic girl envies the neighbor children who must sleep on the cot in her living room while their caregivers are working overnight. It seems exciting to her until one night she finally gets to sleep there herself. The sound effects for that scary experience are very effective and help the reader understand that it was not a positive experience. She then feels for the children who have to sleep there and finds a solution that is comfortable for all. My Two Border Towns by David Bowles, illustrated by Erica Mesa, is published by Penguin Random House. Every other Saturday, this father and son pair travel from a border town on the United States side to the other side for errands, visiting cousins and snacks. On their way back, they stop to provide food, medicines, comics, and other needed items to their friends in the refugee camp until that wonderful day when those folks too can go back and forth between the two border towns themselves. What I Am by Divya Srinivasan is published by Penguin Ran Random House. The young Indian American narrator, the author's child, answers the rude question, what are you? With many of these sometimes opposite personal attributes and roles, in a Walt Whitman-esque way as she contains multitudes. She is a human, a girl, a daughter, and more in this beautiful expression of children standing up for and loving themselves. Norman Didn't Do It, Yes He Did, by Ryan T. Higgins is published by Disney Books. This is a tale of friendship between a porcupine and a tree. Norman is not at all jealous when a new tree grows near his dear friend. He definitely does not try to do away with the new tree or regret his actions. Norman learns that friendships can grow when more friends come along, even if bad choices can happen along the way. Next slide, please. Early reader read-alongs have the same features as eBooks, such as definitions, notes, and bookmarks. Early reader read-alongs support early literacy by enabling children to listen to the story first, read along with support, and then read independently as well. And here again, they can speed up or slow down the narration and playback speed. Next slide, please. Some of the newer early reader read-along titles that I would like to share with you are Pete the Cat, Rocking Field Day by Kimberly and James Dean, published by HarperCollins. It's an I Can Read Level 1 title. This title allows students to read a story with the groovy cat by themselves 
or with audio support. Pete is a popular character which aids in motivation for early readers, reluctant readers, and those who need support in English language learning. Pinkalicious Treasure-tastic by Victoria Kahn is also an I Can Read Level 1 title published by HarperCollins. The popular characters the readers may have met in a picture book are now motivation to read on their own. Supported as needed by the audio track, Readers go along with Pinkalicious on her treasure hunt in nature, competing with Peter for the best treasure. Ties Travels Beach Day by Kelly Starling Lyons, illustrated by Nina Mata, is part of the My First I Can Read series, also from HarperCollins. These are terrific as read-alongs, as some of the language is a little challenging for a newer reader, but being able to listen the first few times will expand that reader's vocabulary and sight words as well. Raya's team from the Disney Raya and the Last Dragon series is a step into reading level one title from R.H. Disney. Movie and show tie-in titles provide motivation to read with or without the audio support. This title, which ties in with the movie Raya and the Last Dragon, explores themes of community and hope and is inspired by the beautiful and diverse cultures of Southeast Asia. Libby Loves Science, Mix and Measure, is an I Can Read Level 3 title by Kimberly Dirting, uh, Shelley R. Johannes, and illustrated by Joelle Murray, published by Green Willow Books. A STEM title with great representation, children prepare treats for a puppy party by measuring and mixing ingredients. Puppies and cupcakes are a winning STEM combination. Next slide, please. Audiobooks have sim func similar functions to the read-alongs. They address auditory learners' needs. They have the same literary features with the exception of decoding. They improve vocabulary, cadence, and sentence structure. The reader can focus on content and other comprehension tasks. And again, these are great for English language learners as well as new or struggling readers. My current two favorite newer audiobooks for this age group are Boogie Boogie Y'all by C.G. Esperanza, published by Catherine, Catherine Teagan Books and Harper Audio, is an NPR Best Book of the Year ALSC Notable Children's Book of the Year, Odyssey Award winner, and Purabel Prey Honor Award winner. Three children marvel at and joyfully spread the word about amazing street art. The beat is as infectious as the words in this amazing title. And finally, The Smart Cookie from the Food Group series by Jory, oh yes, by Jory John and illustrated by Pete Oswald is published by Harper Audio. The smart cookie helps the reader know that there's more than one way to be intelligent and that creativity, trying again after failure and stick to can win the day, especially with the help of puns and other word play. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Beth. Thanks, Jody. So we're gonna talk about graphic novels for emergent readers. So graphic novels are great for beginning readers for a lot of reasons. First, they're attractive to struggling readers who might be intimidated by big blocks of text. And there's also less stigma for older readers who might be struggling with reading or with reading English. Many of them look a lot more mature than regular picture books or first readers. Visual clues provide context for word recognition and comprehension they encourage visual literacy skills, like looking for more information in the picture. And the sequential art can help new readers practice tra tracking left to right and top to bottom. The combination of words and pictures can enhance narrative understanding and help new readers understand how stories work. And research has shown that pairing text with an image improves retention by using different parts of the brain. This makes graphic novels and magazines great resources for teaching in other subject areas. They also can help readers build confidence and get them excited about reading. Next slide, please. 
So how are these early graphic novels different from the regular juvenile graphic novels that we all see at the top of our bestseller list and checkout lists? So first they have a simplified panel structure. You won't find overlaps or insets or strange sequences. This is really different. Even if you look at the next step up, say the Magic Treehouse graphic novels, they are a bit more complex visually. They usually have a simple plot with one to three main characters. They use a more standardized lettering for easier decoding. You'll see when we look at the spreads later that a lot of them use fonts or very font-like handwriting instead of more artistic lettering choices. They're usually anthropomorphized characters, often animals or food. The food is kind of a funny trend, but I suspect that some creators think that animals might be seen as too babyish for this group. So they went with food, which is also pretty universal. And usually they have several short episodic stories within one book. Next slide, please. I've included some sample spreads for the books I'm going to talk about to give you a feel for what they look like inside. This is from Thunder and Cluck, and it's part of the Ready to Read graphic series from Simon Spotlight. They have a section at the beginning that explains graphic novel conventions to new readers, which was I, which I thought was great. You know, this is a speech bubble. This is a thought bubble. Read us in this order. We just kind of take for granted that new readers learn that. There's they're learning all about books and how they work, including graphic novels. Next slide. Simon Spotlight Ready to Read Graphics has a couple other series, Sprinkles and Swirls, Red Titan, which is from the Ryan's World YouTube series. So those kids that grew up watching Ryan on YouTube are now learning how to read and they can find this familiar character in their books. Nugget and Dog by Jason Tharp and Geraldine Pooh and her lunchbox too, which is just completely adorable. And our next slide. We have Cracking Me Up by Jeffrey Ebler. This is hilarious. This is a little girl who brings her pet crack into the pet show. So once you, you know, sound out Kraken, all the other words are very simple with short sentences. There's more, this is from Holiday House and the I Like to Read comics. And there's more coming later this year, including titles from Ethan Long, who's a story time favorite. Next slide. It's not uncommon to have popular picture book properties move into early readers. Jody mentioned Pete the Cat and Pinkalicious that are two good examples of that. Scaredy Squirrel is another one that's made the jump. And as you might expect from previous Squirty Squirrel, Scaredy Squirrel books, this one plays a little bit with the visual format. You have more traditional panels as well as charts and diagrams and lists all in visual format. Next slide. So other titles from this group in from Penguin Random House include Archie and Reddy. This is a really great early reader one. This is great for your elephant and piggy fans. Pizza and Taco is continuing that food trend that we talked about earlier. And a little more leveled up, we have a mystery series, Shelby and Watts. Shelby is the fox and they're the detective and Watts is a badger and he loves facts and science. And so together they solve all kinds of nature mysteries. Simon and Chester is just your normal buddy comedy, except that Simon is a ghost. Next slide. Of course, you might be familiar with Akon, ugh, sorry. Um, you might be familiar with Scholastic Acorn and Branches books. A lot of us are familiar with Owl Diaries and Dragon Masters in the Branches series. But before your students are ready for that, there are acorn books, and some of them are graphic novels. And there are a couple others that use speech bubbles, but also have text as well. So this is Hello Hedgehog, Do You Like My Bike by Norm Foody. And you can see it has that very straightforward font the action corresponds with what's happening on the pictures and the panels are easy to go in order. 
So this is a great example of what we were talking about earlier. Next slide. There are several more Acorn books that are graphic novel format. Hello Krabby by Jonathan Fenske. The Biggest Roller Coaster is part of the Foxtail series by Tina Kugler. And my daughter's favorite, Unicorn and Yeti Sparkly New Friends. Uh, next slide. Of course, Scholastic tends to dominate that graphic novels and elementary school category. And there's a few that are a bit more wordy than the Acorn series, but still great for early grades. We have Owly, which was one of the earliest graphic novels for young readers. Bun Bun and Bon Bon by Jess Keating, who's better known for her nature nonfiction. And Kevin Sherry, the storytime favorite of I'm the Biggest Thing in the Ocean, has brought us sea creatures to bigger kids with the Squidding Around series. Now, we don't have to talk about Dog Man, right? I tried to make an Encano joke here since I live with it 24 seven, but nobody wants to hear me sing. So just kind of consider that done. But yeah, we don't talk about Dog Man. Next. So if you're looking for something really early, Harper Collins has the Petal and Poppy series. I think the very classic illustration style may appeal to some groups of parents or grandparents as well. And the next slide. Also from HarperCollins is one of my favorites, Beacon Alley. So poor introverted alligator is in trouble because Beak is his new neighbor and Beak is going to be his friend whether he likes it or not. PB and J is another series where P rolls, he rolls through the farm, he meets B and J and of course shenanigans ensue. You get a combo deal of both animals and food in this one. And finally, Cat and Cat Adventures by Susie Yee, which has a little different art style and seems like a really kind of girl-friendly title. My daughter was really excited by this one. So as you can see, there's a wide variety of graphic options for this age group. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Sheila to talk about nonfiction. Thank you, Beth. That was so informative. Um, now I'd like to dive into some nonfiction. Nonfiction prepares students for real life reading. It helps children find answers to questions they are curious about, and it teaches them valuable researching and investigating skills. They build and scaffold critical thinking and compare and contrast skills. And this is so important in today's information age and fake news issues. Nonfiction books are particularly useful for building children's vocabulary and language skills because they often introduce new words with images that support their meaning and include features like a glossary to give children a clear definition of new words. Nonfiction motivates reading. This age group begins to disconnect with reading, unfortunately, and those not motivated by reading. Those are our reluctant readers. Nonfiction provides readers with photos illustrations, and accompanying short sentences, sentence text that provide an alternative to those thinking that reading isn't in the wheelhouse. And lastly, nonfiction provides equity. Nonfiction reading provides great tools for making real world connections to build on children's knowledge and personal experiences. Next slide, please. This bellwether media publishing title, Frogs, written by a Amy McDonald is part of a series of titles in the Blast Off Beginners Program, which they categorize as kindergarten grade one reading level. Sight words are highlighted inside the cover, and this series has large print, few words per page, and a stellar photographs that average around 22 pages long. Audiobook and read-along formats are available for some titles in the series. Bellwether Media participates in the simultaneous use lending model at Overdrive, and currently 18 critters are currently available in this series. Everything from deer and squirrels and ar to armadillos and weasels. <laughs> Next slide, please. Cherry Lake Publishing provides titles in the My Early Learning Library series. The My Itty Bitty series is one of my favorites for this reading level. The Itty Bitty Bio series celebrates diversity, covering women and men from a range of backgrounds and professions, including immigrants and individuals with disabilities. Wonderfully illustrated, large print, short sentences are some of the things that appeal to me with this collection. 
I find the illustrations to be more of a caricature drawings that may be of interest to our older users that don't want early juvenile looking content. This title here is about Jerry C. Elliott High Eagle, who is one of the first Native Americans to work at NASA, written by June Teal. Titles include Timelines, Primary Sources, Glossary, and Index. This collection is also found in the simultaneous use lending model at Overdrive. Next slide, please. On this side, slide, I wanted to highlight some other publishers providing fun and informative content for our early readers. Be an Expert series is provided by Scholastic, again, around 22 pages in length and supports a table of contents and index. Each book features simple sentences and sight words that children can practice reading. The title highlighted here is Seasons, written by Aaron Kelly, and there are many titles in this series. I Civic series by Teacher Creative Materials is provided through Triangle Publishing. Most titles have accompanying read along format. The title displayed here is Good People Everywhere by Cynthia Harvey. Title boasts short sentences and around 20 pages in length. This series supports civics as well as social emotional learning. From the world of Eric Carl, the Life Cycle series. There are four titles currently in this series, which include The Egg, Caterpillar, Tadpole, and Seed to Sprout. Using illustrations from Eric Carl, simple language, few words per page, offer students an engaging adventure on how things change. This is a great addition to STEM programs as well as fun nonfiction reading. This also connects readers to titles they may already be familiar with from this author, such as The Very Hungry Caterpillar, or maybe even The Very Quiet Cricket, as mentioned by my colleague jo Jody earlier. Lastly, looking for fun phonics titles. Try the series from Learner Publishing. This book uses rhyme, repetition, illustration, and phonics to introduce young readers to vowel and consonant sounds. There's 21 pages in, net, in length and nicely illustrated, written by Brian P. Clearly, currently eight titles in this series. Again, many of these titles are available in the read-along format and the simultaneous use learning model. These samples show how nonfiction can provide a credible and authoritative way of finding answers, increasing vocabulary, encouraging the motivation to read, and equity. Next slide, please. I would like to further the exploration of early readers with languages other than English. My colleague Beth reviewed how graphic novels can help with early language acquisition, including those learning English as a second language. I also want to invite you to explore early readers in world languages. Whether you are supporting immigrant communities or working to expand your world languages program, <clears throat> early readers can be authentic world early readers and authentic world languages can help. Early readers can support the immigrant and refugee populations in your school or community. Um, there have been studies to show if readers are proficient in their heritage language, the skills transfer to another language, in this case of English language learners. Conversely, reading titles in other languages supports the world languages and dual immersion programs provided in schools. In offering titles in other languages, you offer inclusion and provide social and emotional support to people who may be feeling disconnected in your school or community. Next slide, please. I wanted to begin by spotlighting uh, Mandarin Matrix Publishers, which offers level readers, leveled early readers of simplified Chinese. These titles include appropriate illustrations, word written in language, and a vocabulary list that in this instance provides the romanized pronunciation of the words. This is ter terrific for language learning and dual immersion programs. Be sure to ask about <clears throat> our other publishers providing pinyin titles too. Next slide. I wanted to explore other languages, including the Builder Mouse series that are early readers for the German language. These titles incorporate a re rebus illustrations to aid our early readers along. A vocabulary list is provided to aid in the language acquisition and identifies each rebus picture with the appropriate word. Al Mashrek publishers are providing leveled readers in Arabic. Arabic reads from right 
to left, and the orientation of these early readers are presented in this style. These titles, titles contain nice illustrations and few words per page. And lastly, Overdrive is bursting with Spanish language content. We have picture, concept, and other award-winning titles for early readers. They are, these are a sampling of the titles available at Overdrive. Please reach out to your account manager for more information and other available languages. Next slide, please. Lastly, I would like to review tips and tricks for your early reader digital collection. We hope you find these recommendations useful in providing reading materials for your earliest readers. First, we encourage adding emojis to your curated list. These pictures can help early readers who may not have the reading skills identify lists and titles just for them. Some librarians and teachers are also utilizing QR codes as a means to direct young readers and their caregivers to the titles. We also recommend refreshing your collections often. Move around the titles in your list to encourage return visits. Create a cadence that works for you and your students. <clears throat> Create new, new list every grading period or maybe right before break. And then meet your students where they are. Consider seasonal collections. Like now, for example, spring. You can spring into a new book or make everyday Earth Day or even create a list called Leaping Leprechauns. <laughs> Be as creative as you like. Remember, you can use Sora during the summer too. Creative, fun vacation collections for all readers. Those that can travel near and far, as well as our armchair travelers. Feature a title. Uh, this is a fun and engaging program that can feature a title of your choice and that can be changed as frequently as you like. If a student is in a non-English speaking environment, a multilingual interface can be activated to allow for a parent or caregiver the ability to navigate the site in their heritage language. We ask you to please contact your OverDrive account managers for these and more options, such as express reading. And now over to my colleague, Nika. Wonderful, thank you, Sheila. Everybody give me one second. I'm gonna flip and share my screen and hop into Sora. All right. So I'm going to be our Sora tour guide today, walking us through some of the um, great features that Sheila had mentioned and some others. Gonna start with just a general lay of the land here in Sora. Always like to point out the navigation bar here at the bottom of our screen. This is a great way to help students familiarize with the different icons, help them learn um, what each tab does. So starting out, we're gonna start with just the explore tab with a binocular icon. This is where we go to search for new books to read. From the Explore tab, there's a bunch of different ways we can identify different books we want to check out. One, if we know a book's title or a book's topic, we can search using just the simple search bar right here at the top. But we also have all of our different collections, um, like Sheila was mentioning, available on the Explore tab. We can find a full list of these collections here but I'm gonna scroll through and show um, just what this display looks like. We really think of these as similar to your displays in your print library. So these can feature things like award winners. Um, they could be different holidays, different genres. It's really just a gateway into Sora to help your students identify different books that are of interest. We have the different subject listings if students know they're looking for picture books or science books. Something to also mention is that Sora will automatically filter um, based on your student's grade level. So you can see here, I'm seeing only juvenile titles. None of my high school titles are going to appear for my younger students. Like we like to um, have that peace of mind. Sheila pointed out the importance and helpfulness of using emojis. This is where we can tell students we're going to find our spring collection and you can notice that there's a um, flower emoji next to that collection. Or our March Madness collection that we can find with four basketball emojis. Something else to teach our kids is that when a book has a uh, headphone icon listed under it, that means it's an audiobook. When there's no icon listed, that tells us it's an ebook. Something else 
else that's important to note, all of our collections can be linked um, or individual titles can be linked. So whether you want to create a QR code, whether you are linking to an image, that can be a very helpful way of getting your students directly to a collection or directly to a particular title that you want them to read. So there's, of course, importance in teaching students how to browse and having them um, have that enjoyable experience. But sometimes in the interest of time, it's great to be able to just send students directly to um, the place they need to go. If I click into a book, you can see I get to my title details where I have lots of information um, over here as well as my synopsis. And then of course our big blue borrow button. This is where we're going to send students when they want to um, actually read the book, check it out and have it on their shelf. Now I'm gonna hop into the home tab. So our house icon. And this is where I can find lots of information and lots of activity that I have been using um, in my account, my own personal account. So you can see it recognizes me as myself. I see all of the books that have been assigned to me by a teacher. I can scroll down and see the books that I have checked out myself that I can continue reading. Any notes or highlights that I've taken. Note that all of these books can or all of these notes can also be exported if I need to send these to a teacher keep them in my notes outside of Sora I do have that ability. If I scroll a little further, I can also see my vocab list that I've compiled as I've been defining words so we're going to hop into a book and look at how to make these definitions how to make these notes in a moment. But once they are made in the text, they're saved here in the home tab, even once the book is returned to the shelf. Um, so that's a great way to know that your students can continue accessing the passages in their notes, even when the book is not um, living on their shelf live any longer. And then down at the very bottom are books that Sora has suggested to me based on what I'm currently reading, based on what I have been reading um, recently. So lots happening in the home tab. The shelf tab is very similar. This is our icon with the books. This gives us a bird's eye view of all of the books that are on my shelf right now, whether they've been assigned or whether they have been um, checked out by me personally. I can also view any books I have on hold, any lists I've created, and a full history list of the books that I've recently checked out along with the date. So great for keeping track of books um, that I have been enjoying. Something else to point out on the shelf option uh, is that you'll notice all of my books here have the green downloaded icon. All of the books that I borrow in Sora are going to automatically download to my account here. And that means that when I leave school, if I've borrowed this book and I hop on the bus, I go to my sister's basketball game, you name it. If I go somewhere without um, Wi-Fi or without internet access, I can continue reading that book. So this is huge as far as the equity piece, making sure that no, one, no matter what our students encounter or face after they leave our building, they still have um, access to those titles the same as if a student was going to somewhere with Wi-Fi. So um, that's an important piece and, and an important piece to mention to parents so that they know, um, you know these books can still be accessed when they're not online. Next, I'm gonna hop over to our me tab with our little face here. This is where I can find all of my reading stats. I can um, keep track of my reading based on different time frames. If I wanna check my reading progress from last year to this year, or just my reading time for today. Um, nice handy notes here. That's great to um, help students track. And then very exciting down below, we have our achievements. So students will have different, um, have the ability to earn different badges, different options for different things they do as they are reading in Sora. So some are very simple just for signing in, just for borrowing a book. Other are, others are a little more involved like borrowing um, a book that falls under a different subject. This is very fun for students. And as they get older, many students love to um, strive to meet 
all of the different achievements and get all of their badges. So just a little fun um, addition here for, for achievements on the MeTab. So now I'm gonna hop back to my shelf and pick out some books that we can um, hop into and demo. So I'm going to start with my Maya Angelou book here. I only clicked open book, pops right to my front page. This would be the same as if I clicked borrow from the explore tab. I can use my arrows on my keyboard or my mouse, or if I'm on a touchscreen device, I can simply swipe to advance. It's gonna take me through the front pages and directly into the text. Once I'm in the book, I have lots of options, lots of abilities here. I can do things like zoom if I need a closer look at a particular picture. I can adjust if I want the um, display to show two pages or one at a time. I can adjust things like my lighting. Uh, in my chapter books, I can adjust things like text scale. In our picture books, these are going to be fixed, the, the um, text size, just so we're not compromising uh, the placement of pictures and text. I can search for a particular word, a particular character, and I can place a bookmark. I can also click on any, any word to either define or make, place a note. I can make a full passage if I just tap and hold as I drag over the passage and want to make a note for class. I can save these and then they'll all be found under my home tab um, like we saw before. I'll also show, I don't think I clicked into just a definition. Let's go ahead, tap and hold. I click define, it's going to pull up the definition so I can keep track of these words that I'm learning. If I find in the definition that, wow, I don't know these words either, I can even define words from the definition itself, which is very cool. So just, again, helping our students um, with their comprehension, learning new words, making reading um, fun, and definitely um, growing that vocabulary. So once I'm in here, students can always click close up in the upper left-hand corner to hop out of that book. Next, I'm going to quickly just open an audiobook. There's a couple things I want to point out in the audio title. Harper Collins and Harper Audio present... The Smart Cookie by Jory John. So it's gonna to read to us from the very start. The one thing that I always, always, always like to point out about audiobooks is that the, the narration speed can be adjusted. So especially while we have students who are maybe just getting started with audio titles, we want to make sure that the audio speed is at the level and at the speed that makes sense for our students as they are reading. Having a text that is too slow or having audio that is too fast can truly make or break um, that student's listening and reading experience. So you can use our presets or you can drag to really dial in on the exact um, narration speed. So I always like to show this. So if you are helping a student with an audiobook for the first time, you can make sure that it's really working for them. You could guide them through that and say, okay, what speed, you know, sounds best for you? What speed matches the speed in your head as you're reading? And most importantly, what speed allows that child to really comprehend um, what they're hearing and listening to? So that was the big thing for the audiobook. Then I'm going to hop into a read-along since they're just so fun. We can't miss a read-along title. We'll play this for a moment. Welcome to the wonderful world of reading. In this I Can Read story, Pete the Cat, Rocking Field Day, you will be going... Pete goes to the park. Callie, Grumpy Toad, and... Go so we can see the text was highlighted as we're reading. Just so engaging, so fun for students, really helps um, as they are trying to get into, into reading um, or just growing their love of reading, just a really fun option. Um, I know we talked a little bit about the um, using read-alongs for languages other than English, for language learners. We have lots of schools that even provide read-alongs for their um, students who are either English speakers learning new languages 
or speakers who are um, learners who are have native languages other than English and who are learning English um, at an older grade can really lend itself um, to that as well. So we love the read alongs. These are something that we really always recommend. Um, we have curated, so they're really easy for students to find, really easy for parents to find um, and enjoy in their very own collection. Only other thing I was going to jump into before um, we wrap into questions was some of our menu options here. Again, I just clicked the three bar menu up in the right hand corner and some of the different settings um, that we see. So one thing to definitely mention is the ability to add a public library. All I have to do is add library. I'm going to search for my library if I can spell it. Go. Then I can browse and find books, not only from my school library, but also from my public library. So the key here is just expanding the content that's available to our students. You can see it's still showing me juvenile books. I'm not seeing, you know, the general public library content, which is great. Um, so this is something that you can uh, if it feels like a lot to walk your younger kiddos through this, this is a great thing to share with parents so they can um, help support students browsing the public library, borrowing from the public library as well. Also, I know we had some questions about the different um, interface options for the app itself. Um, so in our dyslexic font, we can flip this on and you can see this changes the actual interface to the dyslexic font it won't automatically change the titles once you open them, but it allows you to browse the app or website um, in the dyslexic font itself. We also have a high contrast mode. If you have students that either just prefer this or students with visual impairments that really benefit from having this option, um, you can flip the whole uh, app or website into this mode. And then we have the um, language interface op option also. So we can flip into, I flipped it into Spanish and you can see all of my prompts here are in Spanish. So it's not going to change my actual um, collection titles or things that have been input in English originally. However, you will notice that the subjects um, and all of the prompts and buttons in the, um, display itself have been translated. So really great option there. There's lots of languages as you could see, lots of language options here um, to choose from. So that all lives within the settings. There's lots you can play with um, to really customize and make sure that the app is working as best it can for your particular um, students and community. I think that was our uh, quick tour of SOAR. There's so much more here, um, but hopefully that gives everybody a good idea of some of the things we can do in SOAR and why we love it so much. I'm gonna stop my share and kick it over. Perfect. Great, thank you so much for that really, really thoughtful, really in-depth um, tour of Sora. Uh, someone had asked a question about the multi-language uh, format. So it, it looks like you addressed that. So, but if um, if the person asking the question has follow-ups, just drop those in the Q&A and we can um, address those. In the meantime, Beth, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about um, awards categories. We had a question about whether or not books in Sora were tagged with awards categories it would ease the creation of lists. So the books are tagged. There are two parts to Sora. Basically there's Sora, which is the student facing app and there's Overdrive Marketplace, which is where the teachers and librarians can set things up for them where you purchase content, where you make those curation display ribbons. And through Overdrive Marketplace, you have access to the Overdrive Resource Center. And on the Overdrive Resource Center, our team of librarians has set up lists for every major award, all your state award lists, as well as things just like graphic novels for early readers or mysteries for middle schoolers and things like that. So that is an easy place to shop from and you can create those um, curation category lists from those as well.
Thank you. That is really helpful. Um, just scrolling through the questions. Uh, here's another one about Sora. What is the appropriate age range for the Sora app? Um, could the argument be made and presented to admin, say, library and, tech and textbook coordinators that oversee the print and digital collections across schools in one's district to be utilized by, by both teachers and students? I'll just go ahead. We have districts using Sora from pre-K right up till 12th grade. Um, you know, you select the content on your end to what goes in your collection. So it can be geared to whichever age group or all the age groups as your school, you know, your setup, your budget, whatever your needs are. Okay, um, moving right along, we got a lot of great questions. Is there a curated list of titles friendly to early or all readers who struggle with dyslexia? This is a question that we get in our library fairly often. One of the great things about Sora is that um, all of the books can be accessible to folks with dyslexia because we do have the weighted font um, and other um, other different um, abilities in Sora to alternate, to change the text, such as the text size, um, whether it's black on white or white on black or sepia. And we do also have um, many lists that would be appropriate for all sorts of readers. For example, we do have high low lists of high low titles for high school, for middle school, and for elementary. Um, we do have um, many lists that would be appropriate um, for people who may be struggling readers, even if they are not in the pre-K to, to second grade area. Um, again, because of the um, application, because of the app, um, it makes many, many, many more titles available to folks with dyslexia. Um, uh, just a real nuts and bolts question. Are there limits in the app regarding how many books you can borrow at a time? Those limits are set by the, um, the collection itself. Your, whoever's administrating the collection for your school or district would choose what the checkout limit is. So it sounds like that's something that's flexible and you would base that on um, your, the, your collection size, maybe? That's usually how schools do it, yes. Okay. Um, is SORA something that could be used in a reading circle, like with a group or on an individual basis, like for struggling readers one-on-one -on -one to read on their own by themselves, either at home or at school? We Absolutely. have lots of schools. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Beth. I say we have lots of schools that use it for both individual reading and for book clubs. Uh, we are able to offer class set rentals from some publishers as well that are like three month checkouts. So a lot of schools use that for book clubs or class readings, literature circles. It's, it's really flexible to any way that you can think of to use books. There's probably a way you can use Sora for it. And the nice thing is that if you are in an area where all your students don't have internet access at home, they can download the book at school and it's still available for them to take home as well. Okay, excuse me, <clears throat> another question. Um, do you have any cases that, uh, of people using Sora or some similar technologies, integrating them and using them by school staff like ELA teachers Teachers, reading interventionists, um, school library media specialists to creatively help and show students another way to read aside from the traditional way of reading for in print. Um, so are, do you see examples of school staff working with the, the readers um, in Sora concurrently, I think is the question. I am not sure I understand the question. Can the person clarify it a little bit? We do, um, we do have many instances of, of folks showing different ways of reading using uh, the Sora app. Um, for example, as we mentioned, the read-alongs um, 
and audiobooks and simply just reading an ebook versus a paper book, um, which actually it's not that different to read an ebook from a paper book. There's less page turning. Um, but frequently we do have trainings where we can help the school library media specialists and the teachers and any other staff in the school um, help train them to facilitate the, the children using the books um, through Sora. And truthfully, oftentimes the kids get it quicker. <laughs> Yeah, that lack of fear of the technology really helps in, um, you know, just jump, the kids just jump in and they start, they start using it for sure. Um, how does the sync work when students don't take their devices home? If they check out a school, uh, if they check out on a school device, do they need to be on the Wi-Fi for the books to appear on a home device? Yes, they would be, need to be connected um, one time to download the book onto another device. I've had schools where <clears throat> if the kids don't have Wi-Fi at home, they'll go up to the McDonald's and download the book or to the public library and download the book. And it doesn't take very long. They can then uh, take their device back home and, and read it that way. Okay. Um... I think I have caught all the questions. If you asked a question that you don't feel has been answered, um, please go ahead and add that to the Q and A. Um, I'm just kind of giving it a moment for things to come through. All right, not seeing any further questions. I think we are ready to move on. Thank you so much to today's panelists, Beth, Jody, Sheila, and Nika. This was just a really fantastic, very informative. Um, I think the number of questions is indicative of how engaging this technology and these opportunities are. Um, that was just wonderful, fantastic. So tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email that will contain links to today's slide presentation, a certificate of completion, and a video recording. For more book about Bookless webinars, be sure to visit booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like those that you see here on the screen. If you are not yet a Booklist subscriber, you can now pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage advantage of this special webinar offer to get Booklist for only $75. Patron friendly, librarian approved, and free with a Booklist subscription, the Booklist Reader, Booklist's new digital only magazine highlighting diverse readers advisory recommendations for all ages has arrived. To see and share the latest issue via booklistonline.com slash reader dash issues. And we have exciting news. Booklist, Booklinks, and Booklist Reader recently joined the Overdrive Magazines program in partnership with Zinio and are available for your patrons to read in Overdrive's product, Libby. Catch up on all of the latest issues now. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. One more huge thank you to our panelists and to our sponsor, Overdrive. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.